In the Anglo-Saxon period, Codna was probably the administrative centre of a surrounding estate. In 1066, the Normans conquered England, and William Peveril, a follower of William the Conqueror, was richly rewarded for supporting him during the invasion, and received lands across the north of England. Codna became part of the honour of Peveril, a grouping of feudal estates across the region managed from Peveril Castle. The Peverils held Codna through a sequence of subtenants until 1154, when Henry II confiscated their lands following the poisoning of Ranulf, Earl of Chester. By 1211 it was owned by Henry the Grey, a minor nobleman from Essex who married Isildur, who had inherited Codna. A descendant of a Norman knight, Unchatil de Grey, Henry's descendants included a long line of Lords Grey of Codna, the Lords Grey of Ruthin, Wilton and Rutherfield, Lady Jane Grey and the Earls of Stamford and the extinct families of the Dukes of Suffolk and Kent. His son Richard settled in Codna and was a loyal baron to Henry III. Along with his brother John, they served the King and Holy Land. John Grey distinguished himself in the Scottish Wars and found himself in great favour with Edward III. Together with William Dyncourt, the Lord Grey commanded all the Knights of Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire in case of an invasion. By the time that Henry and Isildur took control of Codna, there was probably a building on the northern end of the castle site, marked by a raised platform of earth. This may well have been a manor house, perhaps marking the centre of the old Anglo-Saxon administration of the estate. It is not impossible that there was a small Motton Bailey castle on the site, although no clear evidence survives to prove this. <coughs> there was a deer park, later called Codna Park, next to the site. Henry redeveloped the site soon after he acquired it, effectively founding Codna Castle. The castle occupied the upper part of the site, protected by a curtain wall, round towers, gatehouse and a moat, which was probably water-filled. Gardens and probably an orchard or a vineyard probably lay to the west. The family prospered with Codna becoming the centre of a larger set of lands called the Honour of Codna. In 1293, King Edward I briefly visited the castle, and six years later Henry's great-grandson was made a baron, Lord Grey of Codna. Henry and Richard, the second and third Lords of Grey, fought for Edward III as career soldiers in Scotland and France, enjoying royal favour and acquiring more lands. The king visited Codna Castle in 1322. Backed by their growing financial security around this time, the family redeveloped the castle. A residential block and probably other buildings were added along the inside curtain wall, and new gardens built on the north side of the castle, overlooked by the new apartments. Although much of the moat was filled in to accommodate this work, the appearance of the gatehouse itself was strengthened with a drawbridge. At some point, probably at this time, a walled lower court was added to the castle, separated by the remains of the moat. The castle was surrounded by parkland which could have been used for hunting. Codna Castle continued to be owned by the Greys throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, with a brief exception in the early 1440s. Henry the Sixth Lord Grey found himself in trouble with the Crown for fighting with his rival Richard Vernon, and leased Codna and various other manors to the Duke of Gloucester and a group of other nobles for five years. Henry's son, another Henry, probably began mining and ironworking around Codna. <coughs> Henry, the last of the family, died in 1496 during the reign of Henry VII without a legitimate heir. He left part of his land to his illegitimate sons Henry and Richard and part to his widow Catherine Stoughton. The remainder went to his aunt Elizabeth Grey, who in 1429 married Sir John Zouche, the youngest son of the fourth Baron Zouche of Haringworth, a Northamptonshire gentry family. <coughs> John and his descendants held the property for the next century. Around 1500, the Zeus carried out some modernisation of the castle in the contemporary style, installing larger windows and bigger fireplaces. A new set of gardens were built on the east side of the moat, again in a contemporary Tudor style, but were probably never entirely finished. The Zeus family were increasingly involved in the growing mining and ironworking around the region, but money problems were really far away, and by the 1590s they were in serious financial difficulties. After the antiquarian John Leyland visited in the castle in the 1540s, he described it as ruinous. The main residential block appears to have been abandoned during the period, possibly due to the cost of maintaining it, although smaller buildings remained occupied. The park was broken up for agricultural use. Sir John Zouche of Codna was three times High Sheriff of Derbyshire. 
and the castle remained in the hands of the Zeus family for 200 years. The last Zeus to live at Codner, another John Zeus, inherited a near bankrupt estate. And in 1634, John sold the estate to Richard Neal, the Bishop of York, and emigrated to North America. The now ruined castle began to be robbed for stone for local houses. A farmhouse, now Castle Farm, was built alongside it in the 1640s. The estate was used for industrial purposes over the next few centuries, with some open cast mining taking place. In 1692, the colonial administrator Sir Strange and Masters purchased the castle and the surrounding estate, and Sir Strange and Master, High Sheriff of Derbyshire, is reported as the last resident of the castle. He lived there until his death in 1724. By the end of the 18th century, the surrounding area became increasingly industrialised. The mineral rights under the castle were leased out in 1790 and foundry furnaces constructed nearby. Part of the inner court were dug up in a search for ironstone in the 1850s and in 1862 the estate was purchased by the ironworking Butterley Company. In 1965 the district council blocked proposals to demolish the ruins although the castle's medieval dovecot was pulled down. After a brief period in private ownership, the estate was purchased by the National Coal Board and is now owned by UK Coal Mining. The remains of the castle today comprise the upper and lower courts and earthworks that form the various castle gardens. The upper court is approximately 50 by 30 metres in size, bounded by a sandstone curtain wall. The entrance is flagged by two bastions with two round towers surviving on either corner. There were probably originally bastions on the west and east walls on two more towers along the north side. Parts of a two-storey high 14th century accommodation block survive in the northeast corner. It is unclear where the occupants drew their water from as the site is now dry and there is no sign of a well. Mining has reduced the height of a local water table and it is probable that there would originally have been a natural spring in the northwest corner of a castle moat. The original moat around the upper court survives in places, although some of it was backfilled during the medieval period or by, by more recent stone falls. The moat is now dry, but would probably originally have been wet. The lower court was approximately 50 by 30 metres in size. It was originally burned, bounded by a 14th century wall, of which parts survive on the western side. The wall on the eastern side is of a later date, probably from when the court was extended in width on that side by an additional 5 to 10 metres. There would probably have been a gatehouse on the southern side of the court that would have formed the main entrance to the later castle. Farm buildings now occupy the southern and southeastern corner of the former court. Various phases of gardens and orchards survive as earthworks to the west, north and east of the castle. There was once a medieval dovecot. 50 metres southwest of the site, a large building with space for 400 birds, but this was destroyed in the 1960s. There was also a large pond next to the dovecot, but this was emptied as the water levels fell. Records also suggest that two local mills were associated with the castle. Dovecoats, fish ponds and mills were all important symbols of lordship in the medieval period and would have been key parts of the landscape for any visitors to the castle to appreciate. The Codner Castle Heritage Trust was formed in 2006 to manage the site and open it to visitors. Archaeological investigations followed in 2007 through Channel 4's Time Team television programme and a perfectly preserved gold noble of Henry V was found in the moat and is now displayed at Derby Museum and Art Gallery. The next year UK coal mining carried out consolidation of the ruins. Most Haunted Live visited the castle as part of a paranormal investigation as a live special in 2017 and the programme was broadcast in March 2018. The castle is now protected under law as a Grade 2 listed building and as a scheduled ancient monument. <laughs>